afternoon, and good evening from wherever part of the world you're joining us today. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today on responsible leadership in schools and colleges, co-hosted together with the Institute for Responsible Leadership, or IRL for short. Today, we have an exciting array of panelists and expert speakers, um, including a welcoming remarks, which will be showcased through a video by our Director for the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR, Mr. Alex Mejia, following with our keynote speaker, Ms. Julie Search Whitaker, Educationalist and Coordinator of Community Storytelling Projects and Convener for the Institute for Responsible Leadership, our partner organization today, and along with um, four esteemed panelists, who I will be introducing them throughout the event. And first, we would like to welcome our um, director, Mr. Arif Mahia, in his welcome video. Responsible leadership. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this conversation on responsible leadership uh, for schools and colleges. Um, I am Alex Mejia, Director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, and I am speaking to you from the Palais de Nation in Geneva, Switzerland. Today we will have a unique conversation on why responsible leadership should be a top priority for the whole of society, and particularly why we should strive to make efforts so the next generation has ownership on this type of concept. Schools and colleges, as we all know, host the next generation of leaders, and it is important to do these things early on so they can understand why responsible leadership is a must in any society, in any government, in any city, in any entity. I would like to uh, commend at this time the work of the IRL, the Institute for Responsible Leadership, led by its uh, director and convener, Ms. Julie Serge Whitaker, and also by its chairman, our good friend, Professor Emeritus Mike Sack. Both uh, Professor Sachs and uh, Ms. Uh, Serge Whitaker are uh, supported by UNITAR and the United Nations in their quest to bring visibility, to raise awareness, and to build capacity about the concept of responsible leadership. Why? As I say, because it's a priority, it has to be a priority for our societies, but also because it represents very well the ideals, the vision of the United Nations for a better world. We have, as some of you will know, the Sustainable Development Goals, all of them, are comprised in something that we call the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. If you didn't know those documents, uh, just go to the internet and read about it, because you will see that there is indeed a path, a roadmap to make our society, our planet, perhaps uh, better, our societies more egalitarian and more inclusive, our planet better prepared, protected when it comes to the environment and especially to give empowerment and the rightful space that the next generation youth actually deserve. So in welcoming you to this uh, unique event, I invite you to be part of the solution, to join us and embrace the SDGs as yours, because in, indeed uh, this roadmap, these 17 goals belong to all of us. And one last uh, perhaps uh, comment from myself, I come from Latin America, I come from Ecuador, and I can tell you that if I have been uh, somehow uh, able to contribute uh, to uh, this uh, vision of a better world, it is because early on someone took the time not only to teach me leadership, to make me understand what leadership is and why I can be empowered to be part of the solution, but also how to do it responsibly. What are the principles behind it? What is the essence? of how you are a member of society and how you can make a difference. So with that, and again, with my uh, admiration for the IRL and thanking you for being part of this event, I wish you success in these deliberations. Thank you very much.
Dear participants, dear panelists, thank you for watching our welcoming remarks by Mr. Alex Mejia. And next, I would like to welcome to the floor our keynote speaker of the day, Mrs. Julie Search Whitaker. She's, as mentioned previously, um, well versed in extensive teaching, management, and leadership experience in a range of educational settings. She's also the current school governor in London, in the United Kingdom, and the CEO for the UN sponsored Institute for Responsible Leadership. Dear Mr. Schwitiker, without further ado, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the floor. Thank you very much. I'm on Absolutely. mute, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and thank, thank you very much for introducing me. Um, yes, I have had an extensive uh, background in education and taught all ages from nursery to uh, degree students in university. And I've taught all levels in terms of entry level to degree um, students uh, for, as, as adults. My oldest student was actually, I think, 72 in the community. And I also uh, work in the community a lot with my storytelling projects, which I also love. But today I'm here um, representing the um, Institute for Responsible Leadership in a partnership with the United Nations on this very, very important uh, topic of education, responsible leadership within education, something I feel very passionately about. So uh, if you'd like to move on to that, I will be focusing on the education in schools in the UK and other presenters will be discussing issues in school settings internationally. And my, my premise, my starting point really uh, in my presentation is that for me, education is a human right. Everybody needs to have access to be able to be educated in order to function fully in society, in whichever society they happen to be in. And our collective goal uh, needs to be to ensure that inclusive and quality education is there to promote lifelong learning because education in its broadest sense never ends. Um, it starts at the moment that we're born and it never ends. Uh, so that's really the focus today. And it's the key, the education is the key that will allow the other sustainable goals, the sustainable development goals to be achieved because through education, various policies, various actions, various plans can be put in place to address those other issues. Okay, thank you. I'd like to go on to the next slide. So uh, in schools, uh, responsible leadership uh, had a kind of different face. It was more like crisis management initially, because we had COVID and in March 2020, the Prime Minister in England announced that schools in the UK would close to all children except those who were vulnerable. And by vulnerable, it was the definition according to the Children Act of 89. And also the children of key workers, you know, the nurses, doctors, other key workers in society could also uh, have their children accessing schools. And that was quite an interesting one because I spoke to several heads who said that parents had, had come along um, and made an incredible case as to why they were a key worker because they felt so strongly about their children going into school. And there were such tales of someone saying that they worked in a coffee shop for two mornings a week, which came under the umbrella of... Um, uh, the food and drink and one of the one of the uh, criteria that was allowed but I mean so there were some interesting um, definitions of, of, of the key workers at that time but the implications were huge uh, and the decision obviously would impact on those key goals it's going to it, you know it's going to impact and has impacted on education and education for all, and also it's impacted on inequalities and effectively broadened the gap in some, which will which will I will go on to explain. So we had all the normal, um, you know, rules that had to be put in place. 
um, the social distancing, the additional cleaning. And what was interesting and that came out of the COVID was an alternative curriculum had to be put in place, which effectively mostly was online delivery. And that had a huge impact um, in terms of teachers were having to rewrite the whole syllabus to put on for online. Um, there were different uh, demands on teachers. So rather than it be a, an easier format, it was much harder because everything had to be done in a certain way. Um, and in a way that children could try and interpret and understand, um, even though they're used to having the support of a teacher in a classroom. So that was very challenging and very new to a lot of uh, teachers. So the leadership at that time was about uh, changing a whole culture as well as upskilling uh, teachers to be able to change the way that they taught. There were timetable changes, obviously changes to the um, routines and meal arrangements and so on, and the usual uh, personal protective equipment availability. But two of those things, the timetable changes and the alternative uh, curriculum and the online delivery, I will pick up with themes later about our way forward. Thank you. Uh, and what also we know in terms about the numbers, uh, you know, in, in pure numbers of children that have been affected and only uh, on the 24th of June, uh, we had statistics out saying 15,000 uh, students were recorded absent due to COVID and we anticipate that will grow again. Um, and we do know that 66% uh, of children were affected in schools in the UK um, with attendance and, and COVID. So it had huge, huge implications. So leadership in the crisis was uh, pivotal. And put simply, we're talking about leadership in an education setting is about making those sensible decisions um, considering all stakeholders, teachers, pupils, and I will add parents in there, although I put that in my head, I put that in the wider community, but it's important to mention parents because parents have been so essential in this crisis, uh, you know, especially to support uh, the children. And um, all of those things, as well as managing the day-to-day -day and steering through uh, the moral path, decision making, innovative thinking. We now need to respond to those lessons that we've learned through the COVID uh, to have that as our guiding light for our education in the future. And the key, the key job is to provide quality education for all. We must learn how we uh, can do that more effectively than has shown uh, that we've done before and the crisis has kind of put a spotlight on that really. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind on the next slide. Thank you. So all the normal precautions as I've mentioned before with the mask wearing the social distancing and now children uh, are taught in what they call bubbles. So a teacher will take a group of children and then uh, teach them. And then if one child in that bubble becomes, uh, uh, you know, affected by, by COVID, all the children are tested and the bubble either remains or is closed down and the children are sent home. So this cultural change in schools with the online delivery and a cultural change really in terms of what's happening outside schools, I think is going to have an enormous impact moving forward. And it will never really go back as it was, even though some people will try and, you know, we're trying to sort of do catch up programs and this and that, it will never be quite the same. And we have a huge opportunity now to rethink things. So I think we need to take it a, a step further. And the key things we need to consider moving forward are the implications for the children and the poverty and digital divide in terms of education, because that has shown to, been shown to be a real challenge and a real issue for many children and many families. The mental health issues 
uh, that have um, arisen due to COVID. Now, the mental health issues in terms of children and young children are evident in terms of the conversations that are had in terms of the language that they used. And a very good friend of mine's um, grandchild uh, was, was with her and saying things like, is it still out there? Has it gone yet? Is it going to be here? In terms of discussing COVID. So it was becoming like a real fear factor for young children. Um, you know, they haven't had the opportunity to socialize with their peers in the way that young children would. And for older learners, um, that isolation for a teenage group, not living a normal life that we led as teenagers, um, is has an impact it has a real impact on them also the implications uh, and the cancellations of exams and what's that going to mean could that in fact be a good thing uh, or could is it something that's going to be difficult for young people moving forward because they haven't got that uh, certification of validation i've been involved recently uh, with uh, college students you know can't take external exams so all of their work is being looked at in a different way does it have the same validity we need to make sure it does because the covid isn't their uh, fault it's not their problem we need to be supportive of our future generation but as with often with a crisis um, what happens is you have an opportunity to rethink, to relook, to reevaluate, and then change things. And that happens not just in education, but in, in all walks of life. So first of all, I want to focus on the po poverty and digital divide. So um, Holmes and Burgess from Cambridge reported, and I will quote, the coronavirus lockdown risk turning the problem of digital exclusion into a catastrophe of lost education opportunity for the UK's poorest and most vulnerable. Now I'm sure this will echo uh, with things that uh, our panelists will say, but certain, you know, about what's happening in other countries and in other situations. But certainly in England, um, I've had first hand experience of this where you may have um, households who have Wi Fi, but they have one device. I had a student who had one phone and five children, um, and she was a mature student, and they had to share the one phone for the homework, for any communications and so on. And that was the reality about what was happening in some households. Um, some households will have uh, Wi-Fi, um, very accessible, lots of machines and gadgets, no issue with that, but really not the skills or the ability to support their children, um, either because of the, the, they don't understand those particular things or haven't got the relationship or patience or whatever to be able to to support children to understand because they do need work interpreted they can't just do everything online otherwise we would never need teachers again it doesn't quite work like that so one of the um, actions that I would really like to see is um, a commitment from a government to access all everyone to have a Wi-Fi and we have programs that are in place that you know in 10 years time all the minor villages somewhere in Norfolk might have them and so on but we need to have real access for everybody if we are going to even up and allow people to have equal access to educational opportunities and of course the wider ambition is to span this for the world and again I will I will go on go on to that because for some in this time um, in terms of the digital uh, situation homeschooling has been a bit of a mere inconvenience or actually some people have embraced it and and some children have enjoyed it and some parents have enjoyed the changes and opportunities to spend time with their children however for others it's been devastating life-changing uh, people have been uh, lo lost their jobs because they wouldn't be able to get to work. Um, some people, you know, have, we know from the data they've accessed food banks has been a real issue uh, for 
many families. And again, that poverty divide has widened depending on the, the situations that families have found themselves in. In terms of the mental health issues, uh, for children and adolescents with mental health needs, school closures has meant that they can't access the resources and the people that they would usually have through the school. And we know, as I mentioned the statistic before, the disruption of education in England, in the UK has been enormous and obviously worldwide, it has been billions of young people have been affected. So the mental health issues and the support may not be a formal support, although for many it is, but it is more of an informal network of access to community, access to other um, people of their same age, access to teachers who may be able to support issues um, unless they're safeguarding issues, by linking with families because schools are very much part and an integral part of the community and removing that resource will affect the mental health of, of young people. So the emotional and holistic needs of young people can't be ignored. And the catch up programs are important and need to be targeted in a, in a sensitive way for young people to catch up with key learning. But I think we also need to be thinking about learning from some of our educational pioneers in England. So we have names like um, the Montessori schools in England that encourage learning through the senses. We have uh, Dewey, who was totally supporting of lifelong learning. We have the Steiner schools, who um, encourage and facilitate unhurried learning with a real focus on creative learning and a creative learning environment. And they're just to name a few. More recently, we have Tina Bruce, who um, again values play as Froebel did, values play as a vehicle for children making sense of the world and learning. Education doesn't need to become narrow again, as I fear it perhaps has uh, before the pandemic and obviously during uh, the pandemic. The other thing that we need to consider as well is the school day, because um, a lot of people, a lot of parents could not go to work um, who, when they had young children because they hadn't got any childcare. And education and schools have sort of provided childcare for many, many families. And on one level, that's inevitable because when children get to a certain age, they go to school and that releases the time sometimes for parents to work. Some parents have to work all the time anyway when their children are very young and have other kinds of support put in place. But perhaps we need to be looking at um, different ways of approaching the, ed the, the educational day as they do in other countries, maybe more emphasis on learning and out of school activities being more of a division and perhaps different kind of support networks for um, looking after children that isn't directly teaching children. Because sometimes that, that can be blurred, you know, that, that can blur into, into one thing. We need to consider what we teach and how. Uh, do we need to keep testing? Is it important to keep testing? What does, what does that achieve? Why would we want to do that? What, what is the point of it? There might be a very good point, but we need to really understand that when it causes so much anxiety for, for some. And as well, um, always fostering, I've mentioned some of the pioneers, so I'm not going to mention them again, but all always, always researching and learning about good practice and what's worked for young children and older children across the world, because we can learn from each other. Okay. Um, would you like to, thank you, next one. So the implications for the uh, exams and, and cancellations and so on. Well, we happen to live in a society, as in, certainly in England, in the UK, 
uh, where we, we have a huge emphasis and valuing on academic prowess. You know, this is what is considered to be um, the, 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 the thing that everybody must strive to. It's judged by exams and it's, people are often judged by titles they hold, uh, which often derive from unfair playing, playing fields in schools, from starting in society and so on. But that is kind of what we live with. And there's an American writer called Frederick de Boer, who's recently wrote, written a book actually called The Cult of Smart and used this, uses this phrase, which I think is quite refreshing. And it's about questioning this pervasive modern idea that intelligence is the defining human quality and that academic performance is shorthand for total human value. And when we look at the um, results, when we look at degree results, we look at university results just recently, um, and we look at uh, what people are actually doing, what are young people are actually doing who have a degree, many, many high paying jobs, almost all of them require a degree, but most graduate, well, a third of graduates, not most, but a good you know, number of graduates are actually working in non-graduate jobs, that so there's a bit of a mismatch into what is needed, what's required, and what young people should be should be doing. Can I have the, the next slide, please? Intelligence, the kind uh, that's me measured by exams are those kinds of titles, is only one admirable quality among many. And we mustn't lose sight of the other qualities that are really, really important. Our exam system has been disrupted by COVID. Maybe it's time to rethink and value education in its very broadest sense rather than its narrowest sense. And we need to be preparing our children for an uncertain future. Now, by no means does this undermine and value academia and those who want to specialise or follow particular academic pathways, academic, academic intelligence really matters. But it isn't the only kind of intelligence and our faith in it must not be blinded by, you know, the, the, the way that, that, that universities and colleges are set up. It's not always logical. And when we look at the results, you know, nearly 80% of students are getting a first or a 2-1. Maybe we need to, we need to relook at that grading system. We need to relook about how we're doing it so that those with those top marks are fully validated. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's more research and more work to be done there. And that's for a whole nother webinar, a whole nother time. So in primary schools, we have a standard assessment tests. And these are tests that are given and they happen in the uh, key stage one, which in, in our uh, language in schools is around about the age of seven. And they're administered in what people call a normal classroom environment. There is a real focus on maths and English. Uh, and those, um, SATs, even though the teachers are very sensitive and parents understand that they're happening and the children are well prepared for them, they still do cause anxiety. Inevitably, they do. And from 2023, these are going to no longer be impulsory. Schools will choose whether they do them or not. So that's quite interesting that there's already been a rethink about that. There's already been a questioning of that because we have to be looking about what our end goal is. And our end goal is educating everybody to the best they can possibly be. And how do we do that? I'm not sure always that tests and exams are the best way. What tests and exams do are test what people already know. So there's not a lot of new creative um, opportunities for new learning to happen if so much emphasis is put on, on testing what people already know. There has to be perhaps more of a balance. So they are part of an accountability measure. It's a high stakes system. 
results are often more to do with the intake of the children and the opportunities that children have had when they come into schools that rather than the teaching and learning itself although obviously the teaching and learning will influence um, results are published and they can influence parental choice so you can end up getting um, schools with very high um, exam results where uh, parents and it's usually middle class parents who can afford to move around and then put their children into these high flying schools which further creates a, a divide because then you are left with schools without those kinds of results and it can foster a fear of failure for both the teachers and the children now you know again i'm not saying that uh, there shouldn't be parental choice and i'm not saying that there should be um, you know, there shouldn't be exams or there shouldn't be tests and so on. But I think we need to be sensitive about the way we use them and what we do and think about education in its broadest sense and keep focusing back on what we need to do to educate our children in the best possible way, giving them all the foundation, because obviously they need to be able to know about maths, English, science and a whole host of other other curriculum subjects. Okay. So the way forward. So it looks as if COVID is here to stay for a while, possibly forever in our lifetime. And we will have to learn to live with it, with uh, vaccinations, with different policies, with different ways we live and so on. And as well as the obvious tragic repercussions of COVID, uh, there are real opportunities for change, just as with the vaccinations and the COVID treatments. Unless everyone is safe in the world, none of us are really safe. It will not go away. It will not be effectively treated. More strains will happen. So we need to have a collective and united approach to it. And with education, unless all of us have access as a basic human right. None of us can be complacent and we have to keep working towards enabling that to happen for everybody across the world. And in the UK, the universal, the universal right to access education has been achieved. Everybody has a, an entitlement for education, but not all experiences are satisfactory for children. And what we are expecting of children, both at a young age, with routines, demands, testing and so on, may not echo what educationists have said young children actually need in order to learn. And I would also say that about um, the college students that I teach, um, when they have a particular a time assignment or a particular test, some of the broader and more interesting learning and in education is narrowed down because they just want to focus on what they can get to get the tick uh, or for the mark and so on. So maybe there needs to be more of a balance. Maybe we don't want to lose all those very rich aspects of education um, for its own sake, for learning for its own sake, as well as having to uh, prove and validate things in order to go on and move on to jobs and so on. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So in summary, I think we need to rethink and we need to plan for our educational pathways to success. Um, some may take a very straight, clear academic route. Excellent, wonderful for those that that, that kind of education suits. And that must we must remain um, excellent in education, excellent with our universities and so on. But that particular pathway is not necessarily the best pathway for everybody. And we need to value different types of achievements and qualities, different types of ways of evidencing worth. We need to broaden our children's education experiences inside and outside the classroom, rethinking the pattern of the day, rethinking what we deliver to enrich it. Um, teachers do an amazing job, heads do an amazing job. Everything I've ever witnessed in schools shows me how hard they work. Um, but it's just perhaps re-looking at what might be uh, a, a, an enriched curriculum without having to cram lots in in short amount, 
in short spaces of time, which is often very challenging. We obviously need to learn from research and how other countries best educate their children. I think we need to review our exam system to make sure that they are meaningful, that they are validated, that, that people understand what different exams mean and what might be uh, best for a particular kind of job and so on. And um, everybody to have access to computers and the way of using them to make sure that we have Wi-Fi for everybody um, and effective Wi-Fi, not Wi-Fi that goes in and out of, um, you know, uh, that you can go in and out of reception or is very, very slow, but, you know, effective uh, uh, Wi-Fi. And to think about arrangements um, for children, uh, learning, education arrangements, but also real supportive arrangements for parents who are working, best possible opportunities for children, and how can that be for everybody? Okay, if I can have the next slide, please. So this isn't the way forward. Um, we don't want a long-term plan with a different educational secretary every few years, usually those who have had no experience in education whatsoever, other than the education they received, which um, by definition was a very limited um, a, a, a section of schools in the private sector. Most of our ministers had that kind of education. So this isn't really a plan. Um, and, to, and to have uh, people making these big decisions without the input from educationists, research, those who are working in the schools, listening to teachers, listening to the children, listening to others who have been in the, in the game, if you like, for many, many years, you won't really uh, do the job. To get the best for the children, all of those voices need to be he heard with different plans, not just one very, very long-term plan. Can I have the next slide, please? So we need a short and a medium and a long-term plan. In the immediate, we need to be compensating for some of the uh, loss from COVID. So rightly so, the government are putting into money, money into um, supporting uh, catch-up programs, Perhaps more should be putting into mental health programs and, and supportive programs in schools, and they are happening. Some would argue not enough, but they are certainly happening. We need a medium term look. We need a medium term look at what we can learn, how we might be able to relook at our curriculum, what perhaps we might need to do to best help children. And then our long term plan is to put all of those pieces of the puzzle in place with strategies and policies to ensure access for all with computers, with good quality teaching and so on. We owe it to the next generation to improve their life experiences and enable them to be the best they can possibly be. And I often refer back to a quote from Mandela because I think it's just so true in all works of life. Um, it's not right to be settling for a life that's less than one you are capable of living or that, or that in fact you want. So people can be fulfilled and happy doing having a relatively simple life and that's fine, but there's no passion unless they are fulfilled and happy with the life choices that they're making. So um, I could have the next slide, please. So I'm going to take the opportunity before I finish and hand over to uh, the esteemed panelists that will, I'm really excited about listening to. Um, as I say, the Institute of Responsible Leadership that Alex made reference to earlier is something I'm very proud to be um, fully involved in and leading. And this is where really we're working with people in the public and private sector to make a better world, to make sure that the policies that they're putting together are fair and just and ethical and all of those things. Uh, we work with various different stakeholders, we work with various different companies. Um, we also provide, if we can go on to the next slide, 
all kinds of training opportunities and seminars and conferences to share good practice. We have members who uh, go out and facilitate coaching or mentor and so on. Uh, so we are very proactive. Um, we haven't been as proactive as we'd like to be with COVID, but we'd really perhaps like to also take this whole concept and work with school leaders and people who are going to make those decisions for our future. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm now going to hand back to Julia, who will uh, introduce our panelists. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, for this incredibly interesting and um, detailed overview. Um, it was truly very exciting and you brought upon very many points that really um, reverberate with us. And I'm sure um, our panelists now will touch base on that. So um, first one of our panelists is Mr. Adrian Sladden, the director of the Seventh Wave Education Group. Dear Mr. Sladden, without further ado, I would like you to welcome you to the floor. Thank you, Julia, and also thank you very much, Julie, for uh, an inspiring uh, uh, talk on many of the things that uh, um, are very evident for leadership in the world today. And, and Julie and I should come clean and, and probably tell you all out there that she and I are actually re writing a chapter for the United Nations on responsible leadership in schools and colleges. Uh, and we've been, I think, Julie, it's fair to say, kicking these ideas around uh, and seeing how they resonate. And certainly there's a lot to chew on in, in terms of what you were saying. Um, I'm aware that um, we're on a fairly tight schedule. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the fact that I spent 15 years as a mainstream teacher of English, mathematics and drama. So I spent a lot of time at the sharp end of the academic side of things. And then I spent the last 15 years talking about skills, about activity-based learning, about emotional intelligence and majoring in the other half of the uh, uh, of, of the arena, you might argue. So I think uh, my present position is to look at how we bring all of that learning together into a better space. And so here's my little overview of the, uh, I think I've got seven minutes, but I'll try and keep it even shorter. A little bit of background reading. I wanted to find someone who gave us some context to where my um, speech is gonna take us this afternoon. Um, some thoughts on shaping the future. Uh, I started my own consultancy a few years ago with a, a presentation called Dream Schools, looking at what we could do if there were no rules, if we could tear down the walls, if we had the, the budget from heaven. So we're gonna have a look at some of those things just briefly. And then I wanna bring you three examples of responsible leadership in secondary education. And these are three that actually we're gonna put into the chapter of our book. Um, one is UK, one is Hong Kong, one is China. So I hope again, we're looking at a sort of global view of, of what's going on out there. Uh, so you can have the next slide, please, um, Julia. Uh, Gunter Kress, uh, a name I think which may well be familiar to a lot of you, uh, a gentleman who wrote widely on a, on a number of uh, aspects, but very much on, on education and only died a couple of years ago. I found a paper of his that I, I wanted to share with you and, and don't worry, I'm not gonna read it out for you or insult your intelligence, but just to pick on the fact that he says, we largely inherited from the 19th century uh, our education system, our present curriculum. And, and you think about that and, and what schools look like. And fundamentally, a lot of that is very, very true in terms of the content of what we're doing. I also like the fact he says, I suggest that the presently existing curriculum um, that is educating young people into older dispositions um, demands an education for instability. And again, from what Julie was saying, we need to go back and not accept where stuff currently sits, but question it, take it apart, and fundamentally put it back together again to make it into something that really actually works for us. Uh, and if you like the look of, of Gunter Kress's article, I put the link in the slides there, and I'm sure that we can, uh, we can share those with you. Um, but, but next slide, please. So here we are, architecture and spaces. Um, I, I've been to so many schools over the last 30 years, and, and they all look the same. I think part of the issue with where we want to take um, education and responsible leadership is we want to change the dynamic of all sorts of things. Now, the physical is the first and foremost one, isn't it? And I, I went to a lovely school a few years ago where the atrium, it looked like it was an airport. And I thought, wow, they've done something really interesting here. They're changing the dynamics. And then I pulled open the door and there were the familiar dull corridors with half a dozen classrooms on either side 
looking at exactly the same. We've been in that place for so long and it's actually a metaphor for why we're actually stuck with a lot of the things that we currently have. So let's just kind of riff on that for a minute, shall we? And there we are, there's the classroom. Anecdotally, I came down in my own house about what, seven or eight years ago now to find my son, GCSE mocks coming up. And there he was, he was lazing on the settee. He had his feet up, he wasn't even dressed and he had an iPad in front of him. And I was about to go into full meltdown, that parental mode, when it clicked that he was in the most comfortable position for learning. Whatever that might be for your young person, it doesn't look like what's on the screen in front of us there. And yet there's another mode that we persist with. We think that everything's gonna look like that forever. And, you know, and I could have put the Victorian picture up there, or I could have put what happened yesterday in a school in South London. It's, it's the same guys, isn't it? We need to break out from that. And then finally, Julia, if we can have a look at my final uh, photo um, on this, no, no, sorry, the, the one before that, sorry, yeah. Here they are, our, our lovely students. They're still learning the same stuff, aren't they? Fundamentally. Now, as an English and maths teacher, literacy, numeracy, yes, I can see the argument for those things. But this morning, I was on a seminar talking about gaming, and I'm involved in a huge amount of gamification of learning. Now, we tend to demonize things like that, but we need to get our heads around that this may well be the future, that careers in different industries are not being addressed. Otherwise, uh, do we still value history? Do we value geography? Well, we might do, but then with, we should be talking about sustainability and the environment all the time, don't we? And lots of different things. All of you out there will have heard the old adage about, you know, our young people are now in an age where they will have seven jobs in the future, five of which haven't currently been invented. So we need to again stop thinking about, they must have a GCSE in science, or they must have history and learn the kings and queens by rote. We need to think about that again. How can we reinvent the curriculum? And I won't even get started on the timetable, the school day and the school year. But one thing that Julie pointed out was very much a COVID inspired, let's look back at what's going on. Um, a lot of parents discovered that school was actually the best babysitting service they'd never had. And when that was taken away, they suddenly realized that schools are filling a, a huge space in their lives, in their working lives. But just pushing the kids out the door and saying, we'll come back at half past three, is not necessarily an answer to why we have schools, what they're there for, what is their purpose in 2021. So we need to get our heads around that as well. Time is moving, so let's look at three great examples. And again, we will send you information around this uh, if you need it. Um, but a few years ago, I went to the Island School in Hong Kong. A guy called Chris Binge was the, the head there, and he told me about their revolutionary two days of the week when they are completely out of school. Uh, he asked his teachers during uh, um, a, a training day, stop what you're doing and tell me what you're passionate about. Is it photography? Is it um, water, uh, water speed? Uh, is it surfing? Is it diving? And each of the teachers then spent two days of the week actually sharing their passion. Diving was my favorite one because diving was A, something you could learn in terms of per se, but number two, you could actually find out about wildlife in Hong Kong Harbor. You could look at the economy. You could be off site. So learning didn't feel just like school learning. And it was a brilliant idea. Um, the data suggests that Island School are bucking the trend with regard to results, uh, even in coronavirus, because results are up. And actually this way of learning looks like it's really interesting. Uh, Chris Binge has now moved on, but I think uh, I'm right in saying that Ireland schools still have the same principles of developing not just the education, but also of course the skills in there as well. Next slide please, Julia. Uh, Rodine School, uh, my daughter uh, went here until recently um, and they were a school that ran a version of hearts, heads and hands that widely kind of transferable model, but they would spend two afternoons a week off curriculum. You know, um, my daughter went through Russian. I don't think she's ever going to major in that, uh, but sign language, photography. And again, it wasn't about actually expecting them to master these things, but it was a taster into a different world. It was a possible career. 
it was a transferable skill, it was an eye-opener of what else could be there, and certainly Oliver Blonde, the head who's still there, put the emphasis on developing the complete learner and not driving young people as early as possible through tests, through exams, the sort of thing that Julie was talking about. Finally, um, on this slide here, a place that I went to uh, a few years ago where a lot of heads of schools in China, particularly independent ones, bought into a program that I was involved in, which was not around developing exams and uh, academic results, but it was about those six skills that you see in front of you there. They knew all of their learners were very able, they knew they were all very skilled, they knew they were all on a very much level playing field. So how to make the difference? And we actually developed a leadership program around these skills and the young people either in China or sometimes on UK and European trips would develop these skills around what we call sort of mini MBA at level three, so pre-university. And we got them doing some really exciting things like filmmaking and interviewing and going to um, industry and commerce and improving their English. And again, it sort of boosted that overall holistic learning goal for them. And despite coronavirus, I know that it's coming back next year. And I would urge you again to look at the skills basis of what's there. So a brief run around my world. Um, if you're interested, again, you can contact me. I'm sure we can share details, but that's certainly, I think my time is up. So thank you, Julia and Julie and over to our next speaker. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. Sladen, um, for your presentation. And uh, we will touch base more upon that later during our Q&A session. So thank you so very much. And next up, I would like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Alessia Yushenko. She's an analyst at the Institute of Education and RU Higher School of Economics, a senior researcher at the Institute of Sociology at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Dear Dr. Yushenko, I would like to welcome you to the floor. Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for introducing me and for inviting me. And thank you for your very interesting presentations. Um, I'll talk today about Russia and I'll talk more about, um, I think, issues and problems. Um, but um, responsible leadership is also very important for our country as well. So today I'll talk about uh, schools and um, actually the coronavirus lockdown was comparatively brief in our country. It lasted for two months. It began in the middle of uh, March 2020, and uh, it was universal for all regions of the country. So all stayed at home, and we didn't have an exception, like uh, key workers or children with special needs. Absolutely all children had to stay at home. And uh, some uh, children had online delivery, lessons and some children they just had to study on their own and today i'll uh, present some preliminary results of the research it's the uh, international eco fact research uh, which is led by university college london and um, some um, other universities in the world including the uh, the university that I, that I work at, the High School of Economics. Uh, so what we had, we had a survey of 2,000 uh, respondents and we had an ethnographic and in-depth interviews. Uh, and today I'll talk about the main non-obvious disadvantages that um, the schooling under COVID brought out. Can you please the next slide? So uh, the first one, uh, we found out that there's no partnership between schools and parents. Uh, in our research, um, about a third of all respondents, that they said that um, they rated the quality of communication with the school exceptionally low. We had um, a 10 point scale and they rated um, the clarity and transparency of 
communication with the school as once. So it is really uh, low. Second, uh, we uh, found out that not only, not only income, but also um, routine labor professionals were in a disadvantaged position. So they were less agentic and they were less capable of um, helping their children with the homework. And third, uh, I think as in other countries, it turned out that many children, they simply can't learn without constant teacher's control. So they, they even couldn't uh, comprehend the information in textbooks. Even in high school, many pupils complained that they simply uh, couldn't understand the uh, informational text, they couldn't understand the textbooks. Next slide, please. So if we talk about responsible leadership, it is about the management of interactions with uh, parents. And um, the school is supposed to address uh, parents' concerns and interests. But uh, it happened that um, actually parents felt that schools didn't see them as um, partners and they mostly um, limited their role to monitoring homework. So they sent homework and parents were supposed to check if it was done. And um, I think it's not only in our country, it's an international issue. Schools were not ready and there was no psychological, no methodological support for parents. And we hope that in the future, uh, it will be prepared. I know that for special needs education, now there have been developed some methodological um, reports that may help parents in the case of a new lockdown. Hopefully there'll be <laughs> no new lockdowns. And overall, many families, uh, like in our research, there were 39% uh, families who had problems with uh, balancing children's studies and work and life routines. So, next slide, please. And that was quite surprising for us that not only income, but also the you know, professional expertise mattered a lot. Uh, in the interviews, parents um, who were engaged in non-routine labor, they they actually managed better. So they could help to do homework. They, they could help to find necessary information on the internet. They helped with time management and prioritizing of tasks. And uh, actually, so uh, people um, engaged in non-routine labor, they uh, were more agentic in everyday life and in uh, in schooling, in, in helping children in uh, their school activities. And next slide, please. Well, and um, mostly children and their parents complained that it was very difficult to organize learning at home. And as Julia said, there were Wi-Fi wi problems, there were some are the technical problems, but above all, there was a problem with um, self-regulated learning. They couldn't uh, make themselves wake up when they had to wake up. They couldn't make themselves do their um, lessons timely. So they lacked um, self-regulated learning skills. Even again, even in high school, there was such a problem. Next slide, please. So uh, from our research, it's, uh, I mentioned only preliminary results, but we, know, we can see that um, we can plan for in the future that the dialogue between schools and parents should be enhanced. And uh, responsible leaders, they need to pay attention to the fact that income as well as uh, professional expertise in routine or non-routine labor matter. And um, we can see that parents have uh, non-equal 
opportunities and capacities to support their children's learning. And of course, um, children who are coming from uh, families uh, of um, uh, parents who are involved in non in routine labor, they are disadvantaged and they have some special technical and sometimes uh, psychological needs. And second, we need to teach children uh, self-regulated principles. We need to support their learning to learn skills because they have to uh, acquire the knowledge of time management, of self-control, and of well-being. And we think that um, parents, teachers, and tutors, they need to work together to uh, develop these self-regulated learning skills. That's all. Thank you. Dear Dr. Yashenko, thank you so very much for your um, presentation. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our next panelist to the floor, Dr. John E.S. Lawrence. He's an adjunct professor um, of the International School of Public Affairs at Columbia University, a former principal advisor and deputy director at the Social Development Division, Bureau for Development Policy at the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. Dear Dr. Lawrence, the floor is yours. Uh, good day. Hello. Can you hear me? Just checking. Is it okay? Just checking. Okay, good. Very well. Um, thank you. Thanks, UNITAR. Thanks, IRL, uh, for inviting me to this distinguished panel. And um, I mean, listening to what's already gone with Julie and, and the other two, I mean, uh, there's so much to say. Um, trying to talk about the, you, the US educational system in 10 minutes is a bit like uh, writing about the history of the world in an op-ed in the New York Times or London Times. And so I'm going to try and be as brief as um, the pr my prior speaker and just focus on something I think a little different um, than we've talked about so far. Um, the majority of the attention so far has been on method, I think, on what we need to do to change the process by which we teach, rather than looking at uh, the goal and what it is that we have as a purpose for trying to uh, extend the capacity of human beings to live exactly the chosen livelihood uh, that Mandela uh, put his finger on so eloquently in so short a space. Um, I want to make a couple of points up front that uh, no educational system today takes place or exists in a vacuum. It's a global context within which we're working. We all know that. The second point, I think, is that the world um, is facing a complete change in most radical ways. It is the simplest uh, crisis that uh, the world has faced in one dimension, and that is that almost everybody shared it at the same time and in many cases in the same ways. Um, this is unusual, and as you've said, Julie, um, it not only offers um, problems, it offers huge opportunities. There's been an explosion in the online education world. And we have to take advantage of that, but we've got to face uh, the difficulties as well. Um, I've just finished a program with uh, uh, some students from Colombia, some grad students from Colombia on the Indian educational system which has been involved and is currently involved in a major reform. And um, 21st century skills were the key. Um, and I want to, to outline something about those. I also, of course, want to talk about um, schools needing leaders, not managers, uh, but also the need for recognition of the global um, interaction and interspace 
of education um, as a human resource development approach. Now, I come from a background of outward bound um, uh, and a series of um, workplaces and also a, a, a passion for trying to get the best out of people in a number of different ways and helping people find how they can um, perform in the best possible way. And um, I want to try and focus on uh, what it is that we're looking at rather than uh, only what it is that we're um, doing to get at that goal. It'd be hard to find a country that's not engaged in educational reform today um, and the US is no exception. Um, so let's look very quickly at the structure. Um, I think you're all reasonably familiar with this. I won't go into detail. But um, at the levels, we've got preschool all the way up through master's doctorate as, as with uh, any normal system. The difference, I think, one of the major differences in the US system is the interstices of the post-secondary level. Um, the community college system, which is under considerable threat today, um, is a very important window on both adult education and the transition between those that uh, don't uh, do so well in school and uh, the, the um, post-secondary opportunity for adult learning. So I, I've worked a lot in the community college um, interspace and I'm very interested in the way that other countries are looking at um, this opportunity for adults to go back into educational systems in the lifelong learning context, um, but also the way that um, community colleges, uh, in fact, I did a study years ago of Duke University um, environs, the community college right next to Duke University in North and um, some substantial proportion of the two-year degree um, students were in fact Duke graduates looking for skills um, uh, that they could um, find more easily um, em employment through. K through 12 funding, of course, is um, um, only 10% federal. So there's almost exclusive federal uh, a, a pin, a, you know, approach to what is um, the key priorities in making um, inequities, reducing inequities. But the funding comes mostly from state and local. Um, and at the um, numbers um, level, we've got 131,000 schools, approximately 4 million teachers, um, around 50 million students currently enrolled. This seems big, um, but when you compare it to India, the second largest um, school system in the country, in the world, um, look, at the, look at the numbers and realize that some countries are dealing with enormous issues um, post COVID um, and also of course during COVID. Um, next slide, please. When it comes to performance, the US um, verdict is uh, decidedly mixed. If you look at um, higher education rankings, typically the US um, ranks very highly in the world. Um, the university system is still well-respected um, and um, Columbia University, for example, is in the top 10. Um, and uh, our school, SEPA, actually is, is ranked uh, quite often um, number one in, it, in, its, uh, in its setup, so in its um, uh, cluster. So US education at the higher level is still highly respected worldwide, um, going through considerable changes. Um, K through 12 is much weaker. And uh, you can see um, the response post COVID to the uh, involvement of parents in the school, um, uh, you know, in the school endeavor to try to reach students both physically and geographically in getting to them through the internet, but also reaching them emotionally and um, in a way that can get their attention without having them trapped in the classroom at those big wooden desks that uh, you showed so well in that picture, uh, in those very, very rigorously um, architected classroom settings. It's much more difficult to get children's attention when they're, um, when they're not there with you and you don't have physical control over them. So um, the methodology um, is, um, something that's being looked at very carefully, how to get students' attention. 
Um, parents don't rate the schools very well in the United States. And the PISA math ranking has been uh, the, the, um, uh, the OECD ranking system of PISA has always been low uh, of the United States in math, for example. And all of the scores have been pretty much mediocre. Um, so the system itself has problems, it has strengths. Um, but the question is now, quis custodiat? Who can be in charge? What sort of leadership is needed um, to take us forward? I think that, okay, the next slide, um, we need to rethink, thank you. We need to rethink reform. Um, to date, no US president has made education a global, a, a, um, a major priority. Um, neither global nor actually US education as one of a major signature uh, projects. The commitment at the national level in the US has always been rhetorical in general because of the large emphasis and uh, um, determination to keep um, education at the state level with um, state governance, state funding, and um, uh, fundamentally state uh, accountability. The process of accountability will only be useful if we understand what it is that we are trying to reach. What it is that we're trying to teach in the 21st century. What constitutes 21st century skills? Emotional, social, cultural, as well as intellectual. As Julie pointed out, it's not just IQ. It's certainly not just academic um, skills. I, in the final slide, want to suggest that as we pointed to in 1990 in the World Conference on Education for All in Jomtien, uh, Thailand, um, basic education needs for all is now a pretty much international priority. It's like a vaccination, but it needs um, a different direction. It needs to be able to reach those children that are so hard to reach, both emotionally and physically. I suggest that higher education needs to look much more closely at educational policy and practice at the lower levels. There needs to be substantial research and intellectual energy put into the way that schools operate today and the way that schooling operates, the way that children are alienated by schooling. My grandson tells me repeatedly that he hates school. Why can it not be a priority for higher education to direct research, which can be nationally funded, to look at why it is that there's such um, anomie, such uh, a, a, an intellectual resistance among bright children to the whole process of schooling. Shakespeare said it, whining schoolboy. It's always been that way crawling unwillingly to school. So that's one suggestion. Um, the other suggestion I have is that um, public education policy must not be left to the educational authorities and to the educational departments and the educational bureaucracies. We must include uh, uh, health sector, we must include the labor sector, we must include the uh, IT sector, and of course, we must include business and uh, industry and the private sector um, worldwide. The, the private sector means different things, of course, but we certainly need to be much more um, widely based, I think, in our human resource policies. And finally, I want to make sure that uh, the idea of human resourcefulness must be the mission. What is it that we are looking for? We're looking for resourceful people. We're trying to help people be more resourceful, more adaptive, more able, more capable. Resourceful people are what employers want, what parents want. You want resourceful friends. Everybody searches for resourceful people. How do we define resourcefulness and what constitutes leadership in working towards a more resourceful populace. That's my contribution. Thank you.
Thank you so very much, Dr. Lawrence. Um, it was a very um, great presentation. And also, um, I love the anecdote about your grandchild. It's very true. Thank you very much. Next up, we would like to welcome Dr. Krasantis Biamba. He's the Assistant Professor in Education at the University of Gavle in Sweden. Dear Dr. Biamba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia. It's a pleasure to be part of this um, seminar and uh, was interesting listening to the previous speakers, giving very useful insights on the responsible leadership course during this period of uh, the COVID crisis. I will be talking on uh, the situation within the Swedish context. And uh, because of the time constraint, I will briefly give an insight of what has been taking place or what has gone on during this period of the COVID um, crisis. Um, we talk about responsible leadership in schools, which I think we all know is very important because, um, as we know, leadership plays a very important role when it comes to improving performance and achievement in terms of students or improving performance within the school milieu as a whole. So I think it's an important topic which we are discussing today. Um, responsible leadership has become highly significant in schools, policy and public agendas within the Swedish context. This comes in the wake of the global COVID pandemic crisis, which has called into question both the values and leadership diversity of major institutions. Stuff like we have to have a rethink of how we can move forward because took the whole world unaware. So overnight, we had to look at different alternatives of teaching and doing learning within the different um, school sectors. Sweden's approach to the pandemic has been a little bit unusual, as we all know. If you look at the Swedish approach, they've been so flexible and a little bit relaxed when we compare um, this with other countries. Sweden did not have any um, sort of like imposing lockdown within the country, but we had to follow the necessary rules of uh, keeping social distancing and wearing the mask, also washing our hands or following the hygienic precautions. But there wasn't any, um, what do you say, imposed lockdown. The government approach was that people should act responsibly. Individuals should behave or they should act responsibly in society. So that, that was the approach for the government. <clears throat> Unlike in pretty much every other country, it's not politicians who take the big decisions. The Sweden's public health agency, which is uh, run by um, the, that you have the public health agency that takes the decisions, the daily decisions regarding this COVID situation, and they keep on updating the population of how they could go about following this. Um, from, sorry, those who could wear, who could wear encouraged to work from home and travel were reduced to a minimum, if not banned entirely. For example, the schools were all closed down and our teaching and learning was taken online, was transferred online. So we had to, teachers were now forced to, or were sort of like had to change the approach in the teaching way by introducing online teaching. So we had to make sure that the students had the necessary tools that they could follow the uh, lessons or classes that were provided, which was not very easy because it was somehow complicated for some students because of the um, connectivity problem. The connectivity is not very efficient all over the country. In some areas, you don't have some um, you don't have network from some operators. And uh, in some areas in, in Sweden, 
you have particular operators. So it was a little bit of a problem having connectivity within the households in the different regions. Can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yeah, public education is among the Okay, I could just continue. The Swedish government approach deciding to close, partially close. So there's some mix. So there. Okay, public education was among the sectors most affected, as I mentioned earlier. And I talked about the digital uh, problem that there's sort of like a digital divide within the country. In some areas, there is poor connectivity. So the Swedish schools inspectorate published a report which mentioned that the public education system was not able to deliver online digital education on equal terms. Some schools were seen to be better prepared than others. And the lack of mandatory standards for online education resulted in a large variation in how different schools were digitalized. This also affected the way in which we could assess our students. That's Assessment was one of the major issues when it comes to assessing students using um, the distance um, method or using the online teaching approach, which it came in in a very uh, abrupt way. So we had to introduce new methods, how we could assess our students online. The crisis cast a bright light on deep inequalities, not just in who has devices and sufficient bandwidth, which are critically important, but also who has the skills to self-direct their learning. You know, there are like some, uh, as previous presenters mentioned, there are some parents who are not well, uh, uh, or who say they're not digitally educated, they're not well uh, uh, equipped with the IT, um, technology, so they had problems supporting their children who were working from home. And uh, some children found it difficult because it was a little bit difficult for them to be self-disciplined attending the courses online since they were sometimes discouraged because they couldn't get the necessary support in terms of the IT equipment that were needed. It became a stark reminder of the critical importance of school, not just as a place of learning, but of socialization, care, and coaching of community and shared spaces. That is where we had to see the importance that some uh, children or the teachers and students found that on campus, face-to-face -face teaching has been going on for long and it's something that they have been missing because Sweden still has this policy where we have um, distance education. We haven't gone back into face-to-face -face campus. So probably we'll be able to go back in September, depending on the situation. So there's been a lot of uh, media report of how most students are complaining that they miss the face-to-face -face contact. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah. This one is about the government. I think that they're deciding, that's deciding to close, partially close or open schools have been guided by a risk-based approach from the Swedish government to maximize, to maximize the educational well-being and health benefits of students. So the parliament decides, but the um, health agency is responsible for putting out the information on guidelines on the COVID um, situation. So could you go down to the next slide, please? Um, the COVID crisis has challenged established practices and initiated a vibrant education behavior in schools. Because now, as I mentioned earlier, we have to rethink the way we do things. It has brought new ideas. And uh, I think, as um, Julie mentioned earlier, that it has come to stay. We don't know when this. COVID would go away. So we need to think, we have to think forward in a positive way, how we can bring in innovative ideas that will improve teaching and learning within the school system. By using COVID-19 as a catalyst, 
strengthening collaboration between countries, but also between state and educational institutions can help to drive innovation and economic prosperity. So some of the suggestions we can move forward. While the overall crisis caused by COVID created a strong need for reorganizing work and contextually driven contingency plans, remote work paved the way for promoting new leadership practices. Collective leadership models were put to test, and for some institutions, this resulted in encouraging results. Next slide, please. The next, yeah. I think that is the um, I can say. I talked about the Ministry of the Health Agency. I want just to clarify the health agency is run by um, the chief government epidemiologist. Um, and he's the one who puts out the information on a weekly or um, monthly basis what changes are supposed to come in. That is the situation in Sweden. Thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, Dr. Krasantos Biamba. Um, it was an honor to hear your presentation and to know more what the Swedish government and schools are doing. Um, next, we will have a brief Q&A session, um, which our keynote speaker will be moderating. And um, dear Ms. Julie Sertwitteker, I would like to give you the floor for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Sorry, I always forget to unmute. Um, I think what I'd like to do in the Q&A session, because I haven't got specific questions come through to me, but I would like to sum up uh, some of the key themes from our speakers. Is that okay? Can you hear me, apologies. Julia? Yes, apologies, now I was <laughs> muted. That would be fantastic. Thank it's you, fine. Julie. So I just would like to sum up by saying, uh, first of all, thank you all. I thought that it was fascinating and it's really inspiring and it would be so lovely to be able to go off and do some research and really make a difference in the world from all of our countries. It would be really wonderful. But the key themes that have come out, really, um, there are questions about what we're all teaching our children and why. I've heard from everybody um, words like we need to, uh, students to be more resourceful, children to be more resourceful. We need more independent learning. We need them to be able to cope for an uncertain world. We need to think about um, self-control and well-being. Um, everybody has used those kinds of terms across the piece. And very, very few people have the luxury in life of not working. We've all got to work. Everybody's got to work to do something, unless you've got a mass inheritance or rich uncle or something. But um, so most of us have to work. And in order to work, we have to have not only those sort of intellectual skills to be able to do the job that we're employed to do, but we have to have all of those other skills that you've, you've mentioned, even things like being able to get up in the morning, you know, um, is, is, is one that has to be, uh, you know, instilled and, and taught. So the second main theme that's come through is the whole digital world and the digital divide and the, and the importance of it moving forward and how we've probably come, you know, five years in five months in terms of using online um activity in education we all did a bit of it but suddenly that's all that there is with a bit of other things around the edge with covid and now we've got to come to a, con a conclusion really about embracing all of that online uh, opportunity but the other message is very clear that children need teachers the community needs schools uh, but we all need a, re a real rethink about what that entails and what that does. And finally, the um, other theme that's come through from everybody is the homeschool working um, and about the parental involvement or not in it. So um, obviously parents are, are essential, but parents themselves need to understand 
what they can do, what they can't do, what they need to do and how they can best support their children. And that wider um, look at society as a whole as to enable that to happen. Because if you go to work at certain key times, you can't be there to support your child in the way you would. And in the other way that, that, that John mentioned, obviously, um, we need schools to be places where we want our, our children to go to, where we want them to thrive, and we want them to be skipping along the road to go and not being dragged along, uh, because that is what every single person, you know, Chrysanthus, Alicia, Adrian, have all, and John have all said, you know, we need to rethink what we're doing, uh, learn from things, and the operation, the opportunity for collaboration uh, and COVID could be a catalyst for that. Um, so for everybody, I want to thank you for your fantastic presentations and thank you so much, Julia, for organising everything behind the scenes. I know all of the work that goes behind that and I want to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Well, thank you so very much, Julie, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists. It really, truly was an exceptionally interesting event, and uh, I myself learned a lot more on responsible leadership and education, and um, it's truly something that we need to keep in mind, think about, and uh, turn around to make a future difference. So thank you so very much for your valuable contributions, and um, I look forward to seeing everybody soon again. And with that, I uh, wish you a wonderful rest of your days and evening, and this meeting is adjourned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.